Hi, Lisa Joe. Welcome to the podcast. I'm so happy. We are finally getting this chance to sit down and talk together. Yes, I know we tried a couple of times and I'm just really happy too because um, I read your book. Let me show it. Uh, it's called The Blur. There it is. You got yeah. it. Um, it wasn't roaring. It was weeping. Mm -hmm. And I loved it. I was actually upset when it ended because like I wanted more but just because I haven't read a book like this in a long time I like memoirs mm -hmm. but this I really felt like I was participating in it I really felt it I felt I wasn't just reading it wasn't just a cognitive thing I was participating as mm -hmm. if I was there uh, so there's 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 so much there but I said to myself I want to read some of your other work because I like the way that you write oh that means so much I I love that you said that line I felt like I was there I wanted the book to read a bit like a movie I wanted you it to was. feel like you were in the scene I come oh from a family of movie makers and so that is sort of how I saw it when I was writing it and so thank you for saying that it's really yes. satisfying to hear yeah yeah and to the point where in some parts of the book there were parts that just like I'm sensitive to certain things like, mm. like animals it was mm. as if I was there I had to yeah. turn away but then I picked it right yeah. back up I really enjoyed it and I will say I do have the, a physical copy of the book but I really enjoy the audible part oh. because you are speaking in your own voice you're telling your own story it's very precious to me when I heard it in your words I wanted to grab you and hug you and say it's okay come for a hug you know, like I, it was just so amazing. So both the audi audible book and the physical book, just, just great. Let me just start by the title. When I first looked at it, I went, it wasn't roaring. It was weeping. What does that mean? So let me ask you that. What, what did you mean by this title? Why did you name it that? Well, so that's a great question. And I love that you asked it because titles mean so much. It's kind of like naming a book is like naming a child. You know, you have to really think about what you want it to be. Um, so the title is actually a song lyric. It's taken from a very well-known anti-apartheid protest song from South Africa. So in the 1980s, there was a young man. He had been conscripted into the military. And at the time, the military was the arm of the state involved in really terrible racial uh, persecution of all stripes. And he was trying to push back through song the way musicians do to what the government was doing. So he wrote the song. If you go into Spotify or you just Google it, the name of the song is Weeping. It's really famous. Josh Groban has re-recorded it. Many artists have performed it around the world. It's become like a big anthem in terms of social justice. Um, but it has this lyric in there. It's really um, an allegory. It's about the former president of South Africa, who at the time had declared a state of emergency and was trying to put a gag order on the press. He didn't want the outside world to know what he was doing to the black population in South Africa. And so the song is written really directed to him, to this man who was afraid and was living out of a narrative of um, totally unjust behaviors. And so the chorus of the song is where the lyric comes from. So I pulled the lyrics up quickly so I can make sure I, I read it to you properly. Um, there's these, the verse that says, he built a wall of steel and flame and men with guns to keep it tame. And standing back, he made it plain that the nightmare would never, ever rise again. And then the chorus goes, it doesn't matter now. It's over anyhow. He tells the world that it's sleeping because at the time, the president kept telling the rest of the world, even though there were sanctions and the UN was involved, he kept saying, no, there's nothing to see here. Like he And he had imprisoned like over 20,000 people he was holding without arrest warrants without charges that were being subjected to all kinds of brutality in their holding periods. But he didn't want anyone to know. So the it says, it doesn't matter now. It's over anyhow. He tells the world that it's sleeping. But as the night came round, I heard its lonely sound. It wasn't roaring. It was weeping, is the lyric. So it's really a song about how we can 
think that what's going on is motivated by whether it's fear or prejudice or persecution and this lie that we tell ourselves that there's something scary we have to protect ourselves from that's roaring at us. But really, like if we look closer when injustice has happened, what's actually happening is there's this mourning, there's this weeping that needs us to pay attention. So that's where the lyric comes from, because it perfectly captures the the period of South African history I was born into. So it's about my country, but it's also about my father. So it's a perfect picture, too, of the relationship I had with my dad growing up. So the lyric acts as a title that I think in many ways captures the heart of the book. Yes, yes. I was actually, I was getting teared up as, as you were talking about that. But I, I, there are so many pieces to this story, you know, in parts of it where you're talking about your childhood clearly, and you do talk about that after, you're not really aware of what is going on. It's just what life is. And when it's like, you know, a fish that's in water, mm -hmm. you know, that's all they know. And, and it's later on that you started to really understand the context of what you were living in. And some of the things you described talked about your relationship with your dad. Like mm -hmm. he was the big figure in this, in this mm -hmm. story. What you spoke about was like the context, the generations that he came from that made mm -hmm. him or formed him or shaped him into who he was. And mm -hmm. uh, you explored a little bit of that and you lived the life of that and then how that then parts of it showed up in your own life. Do you want to speak right. to that a little bit? Sure. I know my dad is the main character. I kind of think, you know, when we look back at our childhoods, it can feel a bit fairy tale like you know, because we have these memories that are perspective of a kid and we don't quite understand the context of the story we were part of. And so my dad was kind of like either the hero or the villain, depending on that day's plot line, because our parents are both and like no person is all bad or all I, good. There's this mixture. Um, but our storyline was taking place against South Africa's storyline at the time. And it's why the subtitle of the book is interpreting the language of our fathers without repeating their stories, because mm -hmm. I realized as I became older that there was a storyline of racism in South Africa that we want to learn how to break free from. But then there was also a storyline of real um, rage and anger and violence that had come down generationally through my family. And really the turning point for me, it's because it's not, I mean, Monique, let's be serious. It's not like we're going about our days and like, hey, I need to pay attention to generational trauma in my family. Like it's not, <laughs> right? That doesn't happen. But what happens is you suddenly find yourself just screaming at your kid. Like I was just losing my mind one day, screaming at my middle son. And I had this moment where this thought dropped into my mind. I am my father. And it was chilling. I realized, gosh, I have to figure out how to write a new story. I cannot just keep living the same story that was handed down to me. Wow. Yeah, that was a powerful, again, I was in the movie when you were describing that scene kind of at the beginning and uh, powerful, really powerful the way you described it. Uh, and so how did you start to, when you said, realized I have to do things differently, what did that, what did that look like for you? Now, I wish there was just like a manual. Wouldn't that be nice if there was just <laughs> like an on off switch that we could flip and I mean, because I am living my busy life, like everybody else, it didn't look like a one and done. So it, it started with curiosity saying to myself, okay, there's something here that doesn't seem right. <laughs> what what do I do to pull at that thread to pay attention to it? So the one thing that happened was me losing my temper with my kid. And then the second thing that happened is I got invited to speak at the big annual conference for moms called MomCon. And there are about 4,000 moms gathered together. And they asked if I would speak on the topic of what it was like to parent as a mom who struggled with anger. And I had taught on that before at this conference, and I was very aware it was something I was trying to process. But I sort of thought, what do I, what new do I have to offer? I'm not sure, like, what new thing I can say about this. And I was standing in my bathroom, I kid you not, I'm brushing my teeth, and into my head just drops this thought 
you should talk about what it was like to have an angry parent, to be the child of an angry parent. And I, I have, n I had never up until that point in my life even described myself that way. That's not a, a label I would have used to describe myself. I think so much of our lives we just assume as normal because we grow up in those stories. And it was really shocking to even begin to think of myself that way. And that began the process that would lead to this book because, so that was in 2019. I then had to figure out, am I brave enough? Like, do I want to talk on this? And if I do, I know I knew I would have to have a conversation with my dad because I would need to make make sure I had his permission if I was going to talk in front of 4,000 people about his parenting. And that kind of became the slow, piecemeal, fits and starts conversation between the two of us over the next four years about his parenting, about my parenting. In the middle of it, I got therapy, talking to my husband, talking to my kids. It was just very slow process of trying to un untangle the mess of the parts of the story I had inherited and the parts that I realized I could change and didn't want to pass on. So it wasn't like I woke up one morning and decided, oh, I'm, I'm going to fix this thing. Instead, it was almost like I got invited into a conversation about it. And that required me to have all kinds of other conversations that took place over years. I want to say about what you're saying. The first one is that it's very interesting to note that you were not an angry child. That was not, you were, you know, you kept, it sounded like you kept everything inside. So it's mm -hmm. interesting that, you know, yeah, it happens, you know, then it shows up later. Um, that's right. And the second thing is for you to want to write about your dad. Um, what kind of relationship did you have at this time when you right. were saying, okay, dad, I want to, I want to write about us mm -hmm. as a parent. What was your relationship like? That's such an insightful observation that I wasn't an angry child because I haven't actually had anyone point that out yet, but that is true. And I think it's a lot of times children of parents who are angry or controlling or manipulative, we learn how to shape our behavior, how to shape shift to make sure they don't get mad at us. And so most of my childhood was about repressing all the things I felt and making sure I catered to what my dad felt so that we didn't make him angry. I felt like I, it was like walking through a minefield. You had to learn all the time, like, how do I avoid blowing anything up? Yes. But of course, what happens is when you push all that feelings down at some point later in your life, I realized I'm so, like I'm filled with all this rage. <laughs> I'm so angry. I'm so angry. And I didn't even realize why I hadn't really identified it as something that was problematic until I was a parent. I think my husband was a man of such kindness and grace because I think it was very rocky in our dating and marriage relationship, but I wouldn't have even labeled it as because I struggled with anger, not until I was facing my children and realizing this is a problem. I need to do this differently. At the same time, my dad is going through his own journey. So to the second part of your question, I know that there are a lot of people probably listening whose parents might not have gone through any kind of transformation. There were many years when I could not have talked to my dad about this. Our relationship did well because we had an ocean between us. He lives in South Africa. I live in America now. We are, because of the distance, we are able to um, have these sweet conversations when I am home because you're so aware of wanting to cherish that time together. But even then, there would be like this volatile undercurrent to our relationship and me not knowing, like, could it blow up even in my 20s and 30s and 40s? But my dad is a man of really great faith. And God, I would just say this, he allowed God to start to work in his life. And the thing about religion is that often it's used as a weapon, right, to kind of beat other people over the head with, like, you need to change. You're doing this wrong. Look at your life. Let me judge you. But I think if we actually look at what Jesus invites people to do, he's saying, I want you to look internally and for you to change <laughs> so that you can model my kind of love to other people. My dad had spent a large part of his life using religion to hit people with. But when Jesus got hold of him and there was a change internally, he allowed God to start to change him. It was an amazing moment in our relationship because it was one of those 
times where he started to be curious about how his behavior had affected us. And it really manifested because he um, he is remarried. I have an amazing stepmom and together they've adopted four kids. And so as he began the second journey of parenting in a completely different way than he parented me, he would have these moments where he realized how different his parenting was the second time around and then call me just like crying, saying he was so sorry. He was filled with so much remorse. He couldn't believe that these kids were getting such a different dad than I had had. So I recognize that's not normal, right? Like we don't all have that experience, but, but my hope for the listener is that this all started happening when my dad was in his seventies. Okay. And I was in my late forties. So it just isn't too late there. I just really believe there are plot twists always waiting for us. If we are willing to keep engaging the story, to keep being curious, to keep having conversations with each other and to hold space with the potential for forgiveness, because Uh, It's the greatest plot twist of my life that my dad and I were able to move to the kinds of conversations we've had over the last five years. I saw a little video you had on Instagram and him speaking with you, calling you darling. And it was so sincere and so beautiful. And I'm like, this, this is, this is the man that I read about. (laughs) I mean, you can see and feel there was real transformation, which is Mm -hmm. what we all really wish could happen it's beautiful Mm -hmm. and i'm i'm just i'm so happy that you both have that chance of of Mm. her care it's just it's it's just so incredibly beautiful so then what did he say to you when you said and i want to share this this story of of our story our our history I was real nervous. I didn't ask him on a phone call. I left him a voice note because I I was actually too afraid to like have a direct conversation with him about it. So the first conversation we had was in 2019 when I left a voice note about asking if I could tell it as part of this talk I was going to give. And I mean, I thought I was going to throw up like waiting for his response because it was the very first time in 2019, just five years ago, he would have been 73, 72 when I was for the very first time used the words angry parent to him and I said I I've been asked to give a talk about what it was like to be the child of an angry parent it was my very first time to even use that language and what was astonishing to me is that he responded and just said I am welcome to use any part of his story if it will help someone realize it's not too late and I am deeply aware of what a gift that was but I will also say It's one thing to say that to your child. It's another thing then to realize they're going to write a book and want to process with you. So he gave me the gift of that talk, but that then became the seed that led to me wanting to write this book. And he and I had to have many, many more conversations to see what he was comfortable with, to see if he even understood what it was I was trying to say based on how I had understood my childhood. It, It was for him difficult. I mean, the way I would imagine it would be for me if one of my kids was going to write about me. But there's an image I use in the book that maybe I can offer to your listeners, too, that so in South Africa, we have these big acacia thorn trees that you've probably seen as that stereotypical image of the South African, the African sunset and the savannah and this kind of umbrella shaped tree. It looks very romantic. The thing is, those trees are not romantic. They have these giant thorns on them. And if you get too close, they can scratch you really badly. Um, But they're hardy trees because they have to survive in these almost desert-like climates. And in order to do that, they have to protect themselves from herbivores like giraffes or buffalo or impala or kudu who want to come and eat the few little leaves and blooms that they have. So to protect themselves, they've developed this symbiotic relationship with these stinging ants. And the ants hollow out the inside of the thorns and they live there. And then when a sort of mammal comes to eat from the tree, the ants rush out and sting whatever the creature is to protect the tree. And I've often thought, wow, like family trees are exactly like that. We all have these terrible parts of our story. And they're very painful to us, but we don't want anybody to know those parts of our story. And we're really defensive and we get really prickly and really angry and we just attack anyone who tells us there was some bad part of our story. 
That was my dad for most of my life. If I tried to bring up how he had behaved or how I had felt, there was just this constant defensiveness, refusal to acknowledge how it was for me, sort of pointing fingers at us as kids for years. So I think most people who have difficult relationships with their parents, that's how it goes, right? Here's how it changes. When the parent is willing to stop self-protecting in that way, and in fact, let you come closer so that you can share your story and they actually will listen to it. They will bear witness to your pain. That is when transformation can happen. Then change can happen. So when my dad wouldn't listen, when he rejected and denied and attacked us back, there couldn't be change in our, in our, in our relationship. But, but when he was willing to lay down his defenses was when we could start to have real relationship. Now, I don't think that excludes forgiveness. So I actually think forgiveness is possible, even if the other person doesn't acknowledge they, they need to be forgiven. Like their participation is not required in order for you to find healing through forgiveness. So I, I want to emphasize that. But truly, though, it's the, the laying down of our defenses and allowing people close enough and being willing to bear witness to their pain that, that allows change to start to happen. That's, that's beautiful. And it's something that I've always, it's something that I thought about a lot. I've even spoken to um, Dr. Lit, Lindsay Gibson, and she is um, a psychologist and she writes a lot about, she calls it um, emotionally immature parents. These are parents yes. sound a little bit like your dad before. Yep. And, and those are parents or caregivers who do not have the capacity Right. To be able to self-reflect on how their mm -hmm. behavior is impacting you. And I personally believe that not all of them have that capacity to lay down their defenses. They just, they just literally can't. Your dad was able to. And that, right. you know, that's amazing. That that gives hope. There are some that that can't. Right. And I just wanted to say that. Absolutely. And in that case, and, and I thought for years that would be my story. Yeah. In that case, though, we as the children, we get to live free. And the way that we do that is, of course, there are many ways, like healthy boundaries is a really good one to start with. Yeah. Distance helps. But one of the ways for me was was the ability to forgive my dad and in, for things that he and I didn't even talk about, because I just knew I was so angry with him and it was affecting how I was having ongoing relationship with my own kids. And so I've often thought of forgiveness as, first of all, it's not something you are ever owed. Like you don't, you're not required to forgive someone and forgiveness doesn't, is not the same as friendship, right? Like you can forgive yeah. someone and not be, not be in relationship with them. Yeah. But forgiveness I've often thought of as like the key to a prison. Like it unlocks you from, from something terrible. Forgiveness is like a debt that you are owed. Somebody has hurt you in some way. And so there's a debt of pain that they owe you. And it's you choosing to write off that debt to forgive it without them even acknowledging it or apologizing for it or owning it. So forgiveness doesn't actually require their participation for you to be free. Because in my case, I spent years with really painful memories. And the only way I knew to really move forward, to have a relationship with my dad without talking to him about these terrible things, was for me to be aware of them. So I, I mean, I did exercises and I know um, therapists will talk about this, you know, writing out the things from my childhood that were so painful. And in my case, because I'm a person of faith, really saying to God, look, these are the things done to me. And being in a place where either God or a therapist or a family member or a trusted friend can say, yes, that was, that was bad. Like I validate that pain that you had to suffer. And then me choosing to say, I write off this debt of pain to my father. And in so doing, receiving freedom. It's the only way I can describe it, that, that it's almost like an anchor that we're attached to somebody with, but they are drowning and pulling us down with this anchor. And, and it's almost like you have to cut it off, like this dead weight of pain and grievance and hurt and resentment. When I cut it off, um, it wasn't to free him. It was to free me. And and I was able to do that years before there was That's any was change gonna ask in his you. life. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So what else would you like to share if there's anything else that you want to talk about with regards to the book? 
we just, I was thinking a lot about this time of year where we have, you know, we're here sort of in graduation season. People have kids that are graduating. I mean, I have a good friend whose kid is graduating kindergarten and she was so emotional about it, you know, and I have one graduating high school. Other people are graduating college, but it's like, no matter what stage it is, these milestone moments really cause us to reflect And as parents, I don't know about you, but I can sometimes go down a dark spiral staircase of doom when I think about, oh, like he's leaving my house. What are all the memories he'll take? Like, what are all the terrible things I can't take back and I can't redo it? And it can cause you to spiral into a dark place sometimes as you worry, you know, what's the story he's leaving home with? And maybe I could just offer this encouragement to people who may be struggling with that, like whether your kid is moving out or getting married or starting a first job or starting second grade and you have these worries. Here's my encouragement. My dad is 77 and I'm going to be 50. And it's just not over when they walk out your front door. It just isn't. By the nature of life and families, there are many, many, many opportunities in the plot lines of our lives to write new storylines that, you know, our Our plots don't have to be dictated by our bloodlines. We actually get to change who we are and where we come from through what we do going forward with our kids. Them walking out the front door does not, it's not the end of the story. You've got got a lot of time ahead of you still, and you get to choose what kind of story you want to write with your kids. And being the kind of parent who is willing to do what wasn't done for you, so being willing to lay down your defenses, to hear your kid out, to not try to justify yourself. Like these are very powerful bridges to relationships that do not end just because your kid no longer lives in your house. That's really helpful. You can continue to um, connect and repair. And I love that. I love that. I think for some people, that's the piece that was missing and just the mm-hmm. communication. And and if we were able to share really how we felt, if we hurt them in any way, we're sorry, and to hear them and validate, that's all of that is still possible. And like, yeah, going, yeah. And, it, and it's so meaningful. Like as an adult child, it's still so meaningful to me when my dad is willing to talk about things that happened when I was 18. It's not, it doesn't, weirdly doesn't feel too late. It feels like the ability to time travel and then like have a conversation, you know, my 18 year old self with him. And then when I come back to my age now, I'm aware like something got fixed. Something that was broken got that's, fixed. It's not too late. That's a beautiful way to end. Um, and really, if you're looking for something to read, I highly recommend it. Um, it's uh, you're looking for a good movie in a book. <laughs> and it's a true story and so many lessons. You know, I, I'll just say I, uh, I learned a lot about Parthide in your book, just from your point of view and then how you were learning more. And I'm like, wow. So wow. thank you. Thank you. There's, there's just so much to, to gain from the book. Thank you for having me. Uh, so fun to have conversations with people who received the book the way I hope. So I'm oh, so, oh, I'm so cool. glad. Yeah. And like I said, I'm going to go back and look at some of your other titles because I like the way you, I like the way you <laughs> storytell. 